we will be concentrating for now on enzyme inhibition. And to start things off, we call an inhibitor as something that can bind to an enzyme but interferes with its activity. This is, of course, to contrast it with a substrate, which we already know. Once a substrate binds to an enzyme, the substrate becomes the product, and we can say that the enzyme has performed some kind of action or activity. All right. Of course, if you ask, why inhibitor? Why something that interferes or decreases activity? Don't we have things which can increase instead the enzyme activity? Actually, there are what we call enzyme activators. But in the context of, let's say, drugs or poisons or, or most small molecules that we can study in medicine or pharmacology, most of them work by inhibiting enzymes whenever enzymes are the target. So we will instead use inhibition as the model instead of enzyme activation. Now, setting that aside, look here, I have three different um, axes to discuss three different types of enzyme inhibition. Now, to start things off, the white plot here is actually consistent in all of these three, and this resembles the plot wherein we don't have any inhibitors. So you can imagine I have an enzyme that's uh, without the presence of any inhibitor at all. That would remind us that we can actually trace this plateau to get the Vmax, get the half of that Vmax, trace it to the plot, go down, and this would be our Km. And this is important because depending on the type of inhibition, either the Vmax or Km or both may be affected. Of course, since uh, all of these three plots are just copy-pastes, I'll just plot everything here. Pretty much the same. Vmax, this is one half, then this is the Km. And uh, maybe I could just skip the plotting altogether. These are just estimates anyway. All right, so now the thing which is different in these three are, of course, these red plots, which will resemble the plots once we have a particular type of inhibitor. Now, the first one here is actually called competitive inhibition. And before we even go to the graph, I have here a simple graphical representation of this type of inhibition. Remember, we have an enzyme, and it's supposed to have a certain cavity called an active site, and the substrate must be complementary such that it would fit to the cavity given by the active site. But a so-called competitive inhibitor actually has also a level of complementarity with the, enzyme, with the enzyme, such that we can imagine that the substrate and inhibitor both have a chance to bind with the active site, as if you can imagine these two things are gutting out, fighting out with each other. Thus, the word competitive, they're trying to compete for the active site. And uh, long story short, we're, we're going to skip some of the complicated computations. The plot from the white one will be adjusted to the red one right here. So this is with the competitive inhibitor. And if we try to plot the Vmax and the Km, what will we get? So as you can see here, although it's kind of uh, faint, I made sure that the plateau of the no inhibitor and the with inhibitor uh, plots are the same, such that I'm trying to tell you here, we actually get the same Vmax. Therefore, we're going to get the same one half. And uh, if I trace it to the red plot down here, this is now the Km. Um, we can actually call the uh, red one as the final Km, final Vmax, compared to the initial yellow ones. And uh, let's see what happened. The Vmax I mentioned just uh, recently did not change, so the Vmax is the same. However, the Km, which was initially just this in terms of uh, quantity, became this. So essentially, the number became higher. So the, the Km went up. It increased. Now, if I ask you, what does this tell us about the affinity? Remember, if you watched my discussion on enzyme kinetics, it's an inverse relationship, so that means that the affinity actually went down, which makes sense because doesn't it make sense when I have something that's competing with something else, the original attention or kind of affinity of the enzyme would kind of be split between the two.
Okay, so this is the uh, expected result for competitive increase KM same with Vmax. Now the second one is called non-competitive inhibition. Sometimes it's called mixed inhibition, although the reason for this is quite mathematical, but we'll skip that. Wherein this is the plot we get. So obviously the plateau went down. It as long as it goes down, it doesn't have to be this big. It can go down just this much or this much or this much. And uh, the idea here is that the Vmax would uh, change now. Of course, the half of the Vmax would be different also. Um, I actually didn't get the perfect intersection. So maybe let's try to change the estimates a bit. Just a bit. So let's say this is the half of the Vmax and then it intersects here. And then let's just imagine that this is the intersection point. And then we get, more or less, not perfectly as you can see, I tried to force it actually, but the KM is quite close to the point that I'll just say that the KM is almost the same. But the Vmax obviously from this one, it went all the way down. I did mention it, it doesn't matter if it goes here, here, or here, but it will always go down. So this is the expected change in the KM and Vmax if I have a non-competitive inhibitor. Now, I actually fast-forwarded to the plot, but I forgot to show you this one. So why do we call it in the first place non-competitive? Well, it means that basically our inhibitor right here is not trying to find some kind of competition or fight with the substrate. Why? Because here you can see clearly that the inhibitor is at the place that is different from our substrate. Such that if we call this cavity as the active site, there is another site here that we can call as the allosteric site. And since the inhibitor has a site of its own, it's not technically trying to fight or compete with the substrate. Now, this is kind of scary, um, for the substrate at least. Because here, when we were here at the competitive um, type of inhibition, since they're just fighting it out, all we need for the substrate to go back to the maximum velocity is to increase so much substrate, the overnumber, the inhibitor, and all of them will just dominate the active site. But here, if I add so much substrate, it doesn't make any sense because in the first place, even if I add like a million, a billion molecules of substrate, they're binding here and they're not really trying to, they're not gonna do anything to this inhibitor which is located somewhere else. So you can clearly see that here the maximal velocity is very high and the maximal velocity cannot anymore return all the way back here because there is no competition in the first place. You, you, you can't do anything about it. This will go on and on and on and you'll never get back here. That's why another word that we associate a lot with non-competitive inhibition is irreversible. You just can't get back to the original maximal velocity you have before. Okay, This would be something I will use later, but let me move first to the third type of inhibition. This one is called uncompetitive inhibition, which is kind of confusing because the prefixes un and non are kind of interchangeable. So I'll have to explain uh, clearly uh, what makes them different. So first going to the diagram, you see here that the inhibitor binds to the enzyme substrate complex. But notice, if the enzyme is not attached to the substrate, the here you can see here that the shape of the allosteric site is not the same as the shape of the active site with the enzyme substrate complex. And if this one does not fit Obviously, it's not complementary to this pattern here. That means that the inhibitor cannot actually bind to the enzyme if the enzyme has no substrate with it. This is what makes uncompetitive different from non-competitive. In uncompetitive, the inhibitor can only target the ES complex, not the enzyme alone. But if I have in a non-competitive inhibitor, even if my enzyme has a substrate, or not, the inhibitor can go both ways. That is, a, well, one of the ways we can justify the word mixed. 
mixed in the sense that the inhibitor can act, uh, act on both the enzyme alone and the enzyme with the substrate. Here, in uncompetitive, this is the only choice we have. And, of course, uh, magic, the plot kind of becomes different compared to this one. So, obviously, you can clearly see here that the VMAX is still, you know, uh, changed. It still went down. So, you could put that here already. But, if I try to get one half of that VMAX, trace it to the plot, and then I get my final KM, what happened is that the KM moved from here to here. So actually, the KM went down. Okay, So that's the defining factor, at least in terms of the data, um, for uncompetitive. So to differentiate them, one, in the plot, the KM is supposed to move in uncompetitive. In non-competitive, it's supposed to coincide. Of course, that would lead to this one. KM goes down. Here, KM is the same. Another neat way to remember the changes in uncompetitive inhibition is that both go down.